decided to stop playing and focus more into coaching. So it was tough. I chose to, to go into coaching just because I wanted to be in the game for long. As I said, the 15, 16, my, in my opinion, is the under 18s is where you decide whether that player more or less has something that he was, he was going to be a professional or not. In the sense that, am I qualified enough? Am I staying ahead of everybody else? Am I experienced enough? Am I doing enough to go and study the game? I think at the moment, they, they have been developing you know, infrastructure, but they're, they're developing stadiums. I think there needs to be a lot more grassroots uh, leagues and clubs. Because I remember when I was there, and even still, it's the same apart from one or two cities that are quite big like Tirana, the, the families, because of their hardship, playing or Kosovo or during the war, they have that work ethic, they have that desire to achieve something in their life, you know, and also for their kids to do something. So they instill that in them, and you need to work, you need to dedicate, you need to educate yourself. That's the minimum you can do to achieve something. You Hello everyone, <coughs> welcome to the Coach Gerald Lemmy podcast, myself Gerald Lemmy. Today I've got a special guest, a very, very good ma- uh, coach, uh, hopefully one day will become a manager also for our national team maybe one day, but um, I'd like to introduce <laughs> my special guest for today, Armand Cavaya. He's a coach with Watford Academy, um, it's a pleasure to have you on as well. Pleasure to be on here mate. Perfect, perfect. So, yeah, we're, we're both Albanian. I'm a bit embarrassed that I can't really speak Albanian too well. Um, but we'll get through it anyway in English, so it's not a problem. Yeah, of what, course. What we, what we always <laughs> want to do um, on, the, on the show is to give the viewers a bit of context of who you are, what you've, what, what you've been doing, um, where you grew up. Yeah, no problem. So if you could just talk to us a little bit about your childhood um, and where you grew up. Yeah, so I um, I grew up in Albania uh, until the age of 12, so I moved to the UK at the, at the age of 12. Um, I moved with my family, obviously, for for because it was a difficult time at the time. Um, I didn't speak a word of English when I moved here, so obviously it was, it was a tough, tough uh, time when I initially came here. Uh, so yeah, I've been here for now nearly 20 years, um, but grew up up to 12 in Albania. Mm-hmm. Wow, wow. So yeah, that... What you said in terms of not being able to speak a word of English and look at us now same thing you know yeah. I came to England when I was eight going on to nine years old didn't speak a word of English what was that like for you you know transitioning from Albania to England where whereabouts in England did you grow up and how was that um the transition to be honest there was a couple people in the school where I went um teachers and students um, some um, Albanian ethnic students, so from Kosovo, Albania, mm-hmm. uh, that really supported me. Uh, but also my nature of, you know, and, and actually the reason why we're here, the love for the for the game actually uh, helped me out a lot because I would go out on the um, on the playground and just play football, and then through that you pick up things, you pick up words, you. So, allowed me to build relationships here, and uh, and I adapted quite quickly in that sense. Of although the language started um, wasn't the best at the beginning, I started to 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 learn a little bit more as that went on. But um, yeah, I think uh, it wasn't the, the, the easiest, but uh, adapted quickly. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure, for sure. And um, where where in England did you? Uh, um, so I, I, I've i always been in and around uh, West London, so I was um, around uh, Chelsea, around uh, Elf's Court, Hammersmith, around those areas, Olympia, um, and then I went to school to in in St. John's Wood, um, so I used to commute up and down to there. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. So this is not, not a bad area to grow up around, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I think... Uh, the, the, the area here is at least a safe area. It's a, you know, loads of things you can do here. Um, we had the park close to us, so again, that's another way of me kind of um, falling more in love with the game and, and getting out there and getting to know people. So no, it's a lovely area, and I, I'm quite pleased. Although I've moved to South London now, uh, okay, <laughs> which, uh, <laughs> uh, it's a bit of a change. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, for sure. And and how have you been keeping during this time as well during uh, the quarantine? Um, I'm I'm not gonna lie to you. Not that 
I would say I've enjoyed because of what's happened, but I have enjoyed because I've dedicated a lot of time on, obviously we've been doing a lot of things from work, from home, like redesigning the philosophy, redesigning the training program and so on. So a lot of logistical stuff. So that, that's fine with, you know, I think something like that. Uh, I think the business will change where people, whatever we can do at home, we will be allowed to do that at home instead of having to come into office to do yeah. logistical stuff. Yeah. So that's been good. Uh, but also at the same time, you know, some self-development things, you know, online courses or just having the time to just go for a walk and have a little mm -hmm. think in the park. Um, so in that sense, I have enjoyed it. Obviously, it's been tough to see family and friends and socialize and so on. But there's, you know, positives and negatives from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, for sure, for sure. But um, I wanted to go back into your football career as well. In terms of you yeah. playing over the game, tell me about that journey. Did you did you play you know, for your local teams or anything like that? How did that go about? Yeah, so if I go right to the beginning and try and make it as short as possible, really, but um, when I moved to the UK at 12, um, I, I fell in love with the game because my cousin played professionally back home and um, you know, in Albania, there's normally one team per town or mm -hmm. per, per city, uh, apart from Tirana, who's got a couple of teams, but you generally support the, the local team. Mm -hmm. And so my cousin used to play for them and then he was doing quite well at the time. So we used to go as, you know, cousins or with my dad and so on. And we used to walk, you know, 20, 30 minutes, mm -hmm. go to the stadium, we used to get in for free. And then through that, obviously, I wanted to play myself. I was, you know, was interested in playing and um, didn't have the opportunity obviously my parents wanted to, to, to move away so it was always like oh well we're going to move we're going to move so we never, I never had the opportunity there I came to the UK and then again the first couple of years was a struggle because we didn't know anyone um, so uh, through friends at school I started playing at 15-16 for a local team near where I was going to school which is called Island Tigers um, and then through there I, I my, my coaching journey started um, so I, I went into coaching with their youth teams and then I was playing for the under-19s reserve team and then first team. And then I got an opportunity to, uh, well, whilst I was at university, to go into Crystal Palace to do some analysis with the, the 23s and 18s. And at the same time, I was doing coaching with the, with the, the little ones, the pre-academy. Mm -hmm. um, and then the year after, I went into coaching, uh, uh, not full-time, part-time with the academy with the under-13s. Mm -hmm. um, and then through that, I realized, well, where, where do I go in terms of my my future? What does my future look like? Um, do I focus on playing? How far can I get into playing? You know, could I go up to conference possibly, you know, if I work really hard? But is that going to really keep me in the game for, for very long? And as well as I was doing my, my A license and my... Um, my degree i want to i enjoy this game i want to be part of it for longer than just you know 10 years of, of playing so i decided to stop playing at that you know after two years of semi-pro uh, first team football i decided to stop playing and focus more into coaching so I, I you know i went to palace especially with the clash of the days they trained as well in the evening mm -hmm. so it was tough but i chose to to go into coaching just because i wanted to be in the game for longer mm -hmm. than like i said the uh, 10 years Mm, yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Um, like you said, you know, you moved to Albania, well, from Albania to to England at the age of twelve to yeah. to have a better life. Um, now, you know, in terms of parents, you know, when when you move when they're moving to England, they want you to yeah. to do something where it would be maybe a lawyer, a doctor, something like that. If you you nail on the head, that doctor. <laughs> <laughs> you've you've <laughs> gone into, you've gone into coaching. Um, it's not the most lucrative career to go into in terms of when no. you're first starting off. Um, yeah. There's a lot of long hours, a lot of hard work, a lot of different types of jobs that you'll be doing. Now, for you, what made you... Of course, you said you loved the game of football um, and you wanted to get into coaching. But how was that, you know, speaking with your parents and letting them know, you know what, I'm going to go into coaching. I'm going to do this as a, as a career for myself. Like, what was that like? What was that conversation like? I think it was tough uh, at the beginning. And I'm not going to lie to you. I did a year of um, biology, chemistry and physics at, at mm -hmm. um, A-levels. And, you know, especially the fact that I had only been in the country for three years, I think, at the time. It was tough. Mm -hmm. You know, it was tough. So um, they had to, to also understand. And they've been, they've been really great, to be honest. Obviously, they wanted us to go into, <laughs> into mm -hmm. medicine and yeah. 
the conductors and so on. Um, funny enough, I have uh, done qualifications to be a physiotherapist uh, uh, at the start, but um, no, uh, it, it was tough. Um, but they, they were understanding and they saw that, you know, that wasn't something that I enjoyed and, and mm. uh, they could see that I loved, you know, I, had, I was starting to do my level one, level two at the time. And they, they saw that I enjoyed football and through that I made the transition. So I learned a lot from myself and they learned as well from me and then allowed me to, to make my own choice. So mm. through that I went to Hammersmith College to study sports and exercise science and then went to do a degree in um, sports analysis and coaching at, uh, at Kingston. Mm. But no, they, they, you know, it's always tough, but I think they respected my decision and they feel that I have made the right decision and they have learned and that's what you want from, from your parents. And, mm. um, but yeah, very, very uh, respectful in that mm. sense. No, it's amazing, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's hard sometimes to get that over to your parents, especially when they've come from a certain yeah. generation. You know yourself, you know, they've had a different upbringing to us. So, you know, when, mm. they've, when they've come over and they're seeing there's a new way of living, sometimes they might not understand. But from from the story that you just said, it seemed like your parents supported supported you along the way, So, which is beautiful, very, very beautiful. Um, yeah, that's the if you if you could just kind of just briefly just tell us what's your current role at the moment and what what does that entail? Yeah, so uh, I currently look after. I've been doing the role for a little bit as part time for for about a year, and then I took it full time from August. So my role is uh, under 15, 16s lead phase coach. So I look after two age groups at the academy. Um, very delicate ages through many different reasons, you know, through puberty and um, um, obviously they're, they're going through GCSEs mm -hmm. and loads of little things. And then obviously the decisions as, as under 16 scholars, mm -hmm. um, it's, it is tough, tough ages. Um, so we train four times a week. Um, we play on a Wednesday or a Saturday, sometimes on a Sunday. Uh, we mirror the under 18s fixtures with the 16s. So all the 16s will play alongside the 18s on on the same day on a Saturday because then they can also be involved in the 18s games um, and then the 15s will play on a Wednesday. Uh, we train in the evening so we prepare during the day. My day starts probably at 8 30, 9 o'clock, get to the training ground. Um, we have breakfast then we have a chat about the session so we go and help out with the 18s and 23s mm -hmm. or sometimes watch the first team. Um, after that, that would be lunchtime. Then we come back in the office that to prepare for our sessions in the evening. Um, we obviously got a lot of logistical stuff, like we look through players' videos on Huddle where mm -hmm. the games get videoed and, and we have to, the players clip it themselves. We comment, you know, on different little bits. Um, then the players will come in in the afternoon. We'll leave or do some analysis uh, in preparation for a game or in preparation for a session or something that we needed to work on. Uh, deliver the and that would be a day basically and then it would be a repeat for the for the next four to five days uh, until the match so a busy busy day ahead always a busy day busy day but i enjoy it i think especially the mornings being involved with the 18s and 23s yeah. is, is yeah. uh you, you learn you pick up things you work with other coaches you see you know new mm -hmm. things and even the opportunity to because the, the 18 and 23 strain next to the first team mm -hmm. um it's an opportunity to watch the first team learn from them uh, pick up some new things so that just being in the environment I'm, I'm really mm. uh, fortunate I'd say mm. and no, lucky. For, sure, for sure for sure and what's something that you that you said I wanted to pick up on in terms of the yeah. age group 15 and 16 is very very delicate like you said in terms of you know yeah. um, the boys are, are still trying to figure out themselves you know uh, there's things happening within them that they probably don't know what's happening like you said, at the age of 16 yeah. is, you know, whether you're going to get your contract or not, your scholar. And there's a lot of factors for them to, to kind of gauge and with a lot of pressure at the same yeah. time. Off, off the pitch, also, you know, friends, peer pressure and things like that. Now, I remember when I was 15, 16, you'll probably be the same as well, where um, I got released and it's like the, with the club that I was at, it was just, here's, here's a piece of paper. Here's some numbers for you to contact. Yeah. You wasn't able yeah. to get a contract here. Give these a call and off you go. And that was it. You know, there was no yeah. like review on, on how to improve or anything like that. Now for you guys, of course, you lot are a higher level. How do you deal with, with that sort of pressure in terms of making sure the kids' well-being 
is met first? Um, we, we think, firstly, people come first before players. So we try to look at the person, uh, how we do support him. Like you said, initially before you'd get some numbers and you get your responsibility to go and call those uh, mm -hmm. clubs. But uh, we've got obviously now support and like you said, the club has the capacity to, to employ people to, to help. So the, our head of um, welfare mm -hmm. um, uh, will, will basically create profiles for the players. Uh, so our analysts will create videos um, a, a cluster of videos that they have a, like a CV, it's like mm. we've probably seen many times, um, and then it will also give some stats, uh, and they'll take that as a CV, and that will, well, we'll send that firstly to all the clubs, mm. um, so they can get in touch with us, or they can get in touch directly with the, with the family. Uh, we've got a lot of success from it. I think that's a great thing. This is something I I I spoke about five six years ago that we needed to do, and I think that the the FA has has taken initiative to, to support the players and obviously through that role they now can go on trial they can um have that cv even if they don't go let's say they they, they finish at the club at the age of 16 they can still have that cv and send it to other clubs at 17 or 18 and you know to show um what qualities they've got so there is a lot of things done obviously through our connections uh, as staff we try and make sure that we we contact other clubs as well. Um, it's not just uh, the players or just the head of welfare or or other people. We would try and you know through our connections try and help the boys as well. And then um, if not, if they can't find an academy, we try and place them at uh, private academies mm -hmm. where we actually invite some of those academies to come and play us uh, during the year. Mm -hmm. You know, just for example, during the last season we invited about five six teams mm -hmm. uh, of under 17s to play around the 16s. And in those teams, sometimes we had boys that were with us last the, the previous year, um, and then that's another opportunity because, as you said, um, it's a difficult phase for for the boys that not everybody's fully developed physically, or they needed that extra year. And you can see something, um, so they end up finding another club. So not all the boys that get released. So, for example, three of the boys that we released this year, they've signed at two at Cat One and one at the uh, Cat Two Academy. Mm -hmm. So what? Perceived to not, you know, be good enough for for us, for example, it might be good enough for somebody else. Um, but it's just that is we got to support that. And like you said, when you probably got released, you didn't have all those clips, you didn't have all that support, you didn't, you know, mm -hmm. the club didn't do that much. Mm -hmm. So we do try and, you know, try and help the boys as much as possible. They always, you know, they always get in contact with us, even a couple of months later or a year later. Mm. No, that's good though, but yeah. like you said, in terms of dealing with them as people first rather than players, where that mentality yeah. is kind of shifted now, whereas back in the day, you just, you get on with it. If, you, if you're not good enough, by the age of 16, that's it, your career's done. And it's like, that yeah. thing is changed now. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not... It's not a nice thing because it is... Um, somebody used once um, an expression to say it's football is like child slavery mm. is, is seen like that they, they're mm. locked into academy until the academy feels whether they're good enough or not good enough then they're thrown away kind of thing mm. and they're turned out like that and and obviously that 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 things that they, they say that it's only one percent that make it is because mm. of the support and you know actually there's a lot more potential out there and if you look at other examples around europe and other countries they are doing great things about you know with their retention rate and mm with their A and B and C team, some clubs, you know, in Spain, for example, or other places, they have more than just one team. So that the retention rate is more, the, the players get more opportunities to showcase themselves. So that little bit, as I said, the 15, 16, my, in my opinion, is the under 18s is where you decide whether that player more or less has something that he was, he was going to be a professionally or not, because they'll most likely be, you know, 98 to 99% maturity uh, physically. So they are capable of doing certain things with their, you know, physically, mm. um, and cope, cope with the game a little bit better. And then that, that you can judge them. And you also got them in there in full-time environment where you can um, learn more about them as individuals, as people, you know, if they can cope with the pressure, with the demand, of, because it's a job. Once they mm. go on to under 18s, it's a job. Whereas 16s and below, it, again, it's so tough because they, they go to school all day, mm. then they come to training. 
four days a week. So they're, yeah. they're, they're four days. Then they have to travel back home. Then they have to have break, uh, sorry, dinner. And then they have to maybe do their homework. So what mm. time do they get to do that? When they finish, I don't know, at eight o'clock with us. Mm. They get nine o'clock. So it's, 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 it's difficult. Whereas you've got, when you've got them in the environment, then you can really judge them. So I think something needs to, to change or more support needs to be done in that sense. Mm, yeah no for sure and and there's a lot of academies at the moment that are looking at scrapping the academy system as well at, from a certain age we've seen i think it was huddersfield or something like that that they yeah, scrapped yeah. Their, their academy what's your take on all of that i think it's sad to be honest i think especially if you, if i can understand certain clubs lower because there's a, fil- a filtration system so you know all the premier league or cat one uh, academies will will release players and they'll end up dropping down a level or two levels so then they feed straight into some of the teams that are in league two or conference or and so on so they i couldn't understand a little bit from them but at the same time is it's sad because if they're all doing that then you know where is the opportunities for players? Mm-hmm. The, the grassroots game has grown a lot. And where's the opportunity for them to go and get that extra, you know, the next level of coaching? Mm-hmm. Uh, if they can't go into Cat 1 academies or Cat 2 academies, for example, and all these other clubs are scrapping their academies, then where are they going to go? And so then you have a little, you start to, to have this little bridge or um, a, a, an area where you're not, you're not helping players progress into the next level. Mm-hmm. So I think it's sad. I think... I'd, uh, I will, I will, I'm not I'm not with it. I don't support it. Mm. I think clubs should have their academy. Mm. No, I agree with you for sure, for sure. Um, I wanted to get back into your your journey a little bit. So, yeah. you, you're in a good place at the moment. Like you said, you're very grateful for the environment that you're in and being able to to watch a first team like Watford, you know, and and watching them day in and day out. It's like that that's invaluable experience and but for you to get to that place where you are now you've had to overcome a lot of things for sure without a doubt um now in terms of football again going back to when i grew up in terms of cultures there wasn't much diversity in cultures now Mm -hmm. coming from an albanian background i'm sure again you've you've come across a few difficulties do you think like along the way your heritage has has kind of not hold you back, but maybe been a bit of a a, a place where you know it, it it might have just you know lack of opportunities might have been along the way for you. Um, you know what, girl, I'm 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 gonna turn it around a little bit. That that I think you're talking about discrimination is a hot topic. Mm. It's it is a serious topic. Mm. Um, but um, the way I think about it is, I look at myself first. Mm-hmm. Um, as in, I look. I think it'd be idiotic for somebody not to hire someone that will better their their company or their business. Mm-hmm. Firstly, mm-hmm. Um, but first, I'll start it off and I'll end it off with, with that. Um, it's it's a hot topic. It's it's delicate. It is it, a serious one, and I think it needs obviously more looking into it. Mm-hmm. But as I said, I look at myself first, and because it's a, such a competitive. Um, industry it's not easy for everybody to get into it so if i if i look at my role for example there are in in the football league there's 72 clubs mm. and there's 20 in the premier league so we're talking about 92 clubs so that there, that means there is 92 positions similar to mine mm. now if we look at the amount of courses and an amount of um coach education and so many coaches involved in the game they're competing for, for, for example, one one of the 92 um, positions. Mm. That that is difficult. That mm. is very difficult to get into. So I look at myself in the sense that: Am I qualified enough? Am I staying ahead of everybody else? Um, am I experienced enough? Am I doing enough to go and study the game? You know, whether that's watching other teams, like you said about the first team. I'm lucky to watch the, the first team, but I do. I've done study, study visits. I've gone abroad. I've gone even back home to Albania. You always pick up or watching other sports mm. uh, or other coaches in other sports uh, working. Um, so those are two things. So I look at myself first, and then, like I said, the com- the competitive on the, in the in the business. I've just mentioned about the positions that there are. There's a 92 positions similar role to me, mm. but I'll give you another example. I was in the LMA course two years ago. And in the course, there was about 34 candidates from Premier League to the League Two and Conference. Um, so we're talking about managers, mm-hmm. system managers, academy managers, and PDP coaches. Mm-hmm. So these are, you know, the top level 
um, coaches. Um, and in the course, there was 34 candidates. Half of them were in, in jobs, half of them weren't. Mm -hmm. By the end of the course, which was a one year course, it was the other way around. So the ones that had jobs mm -hmm. were not in jobs. Mm -hmm. And the ones that didn't, so it, not all of them, but majority of them, turned, it was the other way around. Mm -hmm. So where do these people go? You know, we're talking about people that have managed or coach at the highest mm -hmm. level. Yeah. Where are they going to go? So if for, if for me to say that I'm not going to get the opportunity to take, a, I, I don't know, a management role, mm -hmm. if I'm not experienced enough, it's very easy for me to say, yeah, so, you know, they're not giving it to me mm. because I'm from this background and that background. Mm. No, have I done enough to earn that role mm. and to compete, to compete, which is the biggest thing, with somebody that's been in that role, just come out and is looking for another job. Mm -hmm. I know people that have been coaches or assistant coaches in the Premier League, Championship or, and so on, uh, and they can't get into to, to jobs. So I'm mm -hmm. competing with them. So it's very easy for me to be to be saying, oh, yeah, well, it's because of I'm, I'm that, this background. I'm not. Mm. I'm, I'm, Indirectly, there may have been times that probably I haven't been given the opportunity that I probably deserve, but mm -hmm. I, I don't like to look at it that way. I always look at it myself and I like to think, and this is something I live by, that success is only borrowed. You know, mm -hmm. you can, you know, I'm here right now mm -hmm. because I've done it, I've done whatever in the in the past mm -hmm. to get up to here. But it doesn't mean that I'm going to stay in this level. It, it's not going to keep me in this level. You know, somebody mm -hmm. else is working somewhere else to come come jump into this position mm -hmm. or i might get stuck in this position because i'm not doing enough to go into the next level so i i, I think success is only borrowed and you've got to continue to to mm -hmm. stay ahead of the game and learn and and get as much experience uh talk as many people read do do so much other things that will keep your head uh, mm -hmm. and that's as simple as that and like i said yes they might have been indirectly to bring it back to the the, the probably discrimination i think will, would be the word but mm. uh that di directly i haven't i haven't had mm. uh, i don't think i'm the type of person that somebody would say something directly or but like you know uh that discrimination is not always a direct thing you know it can mm. be done indirectly mm. but i look at myself first um before i, I start mm. to point fingers why i don't you know why i haven't mm. got this why i haven't got that mm -hmm. yeah not for sure it's, it's a serious role. No, no, Sorry, for sure. It is, it is a very serious topic, you know, in terms of, like you said, maybe directly you haven't experienced that, but maybe indirectly you might have experienced that. So, potentially. Yeah, yeah potentially. So we're not going to say you did or, you know, because we don't, like you said, you don't know. But, um, no. but yeah, like you said, it's a, it's a very serious topic um, that, that obviously needs to be addressed in terms of having different ethnics and different backgrounds within the football community because again you know like myself I grew up in Hackney um, yeah. and when I used to go to clubs and things like that coaches would be like why do you speak like that I'd be like I, I grew up in the, I grew up in Hackney this is yeah for me this is normal do you know what I mean I don't I don't <laughs> see it, but to other people it might be a lot different so again like you said it's, it's a serious topic that that needs to be addressed um, and yeah, hopefully, you know, with what's been going on lately as well, you know, with the Football Association and hopefully they'll, they'll be doing something to kind of change what's happened. So, yeah. Yeah. But in terms of, um, you said you went back to Albania to do some study visits. Um, what's your take on what improvements you think can be, can be made? Or can there be any improvements be, be made? There always can be, even here there can be improvements, yeah. to, uh, especially in Albania. I think um, obviously we've had some success um, and that success is uh, slightly, um, I don't know what's the right word to use, it, but they're slightly fake I would say, as in is because the, the players that were part of the national team mm. are players that were grown up in um, outside of Albania or Kosovo, ethnic Albania area. Mm. Um, they were brought up in Switzerland or, or Italy or other countries around Europe where, where Albanians migrated during those difficult times. So Albania is, uh, is gaining that, that success because of that at the moment, mm. because there's not much, you know, there's a few now in the, in the national team from that have been brought up in Albania and have moved in Europe to play at a higher level, but mm. there's not many. So if I were to say three things that I would, like to improve there or um potentially they you know there could be a bit more investment 
Um, I would say if we look at an example of Iceland, Iceland were in a similar similar boat. Iceland has, uh, I think, a population, if I'm not wrong, of um, 360,000 or something like this, 365,000. Yeah. And um, they, they've been in you know, major competitions in the, yeah. last, in the last 10 to 12 years. How come? Now, if you look at this, you know, what they did as an FA, they, they, re, they re, uh, reviewed the whole national team game, their national team as, in, as, a, as, a, as a selection, and also their, their, their grassroots and their clubs. And what they looked at is um, they looked at developing the, the infrastructure. So we're talking about grassroots. We're not, you know, in Albania at the moment, they, they have been developing you know, infrastructure, but they're, they're developing stadiums. Yeah. Even you know, which is great, you know. It's, there's some new stadiums there, there's some redeveloped stadiums, but that's the last stage, in my opinion. Mm. Although they, they need the developing, but that's the last stage. But we're looking at pitches, so you know, surfaces for for for, for players to, to go and play and train at the right the right standard. And then we're talking about coach education. Mm -hmm. Now, okay, they have the, the UEFA qualifications there, but there has to be done more. There has to be done a lot more, not just the, the coaching qualification. Now they've implemented the analysis. I think coach education there needs to be, from what I've uh, learned and I've gathered from, from there, uh, I've had a couple candidates and colleagues that have done the A license there and they've got an A license in six weeks. Now, yeah. you know yourself, to get an A license in, in the rest of the world or even in the UK, it, it took me you know 18 months and that's, that's the minimum. That's the minimum that you, you, you need to do. Uh, it's slightly changed now because uh, I think they're doing it slightly different. But when I did that, I had to do two weeks, then go away, do do all the, the, the topics that we had to do, whether that's analysis or whether it was session plans and so on. And then we had to a big folder that we had to, to, to submit. And then that through that, we didn't have to get assessment. And if you, you, you know, if you didn't deserve it, you didn't deserve it, you didn't get through. So, you know, it wasn't all, everybody would pass. Whereas I've heard that, they majority or in 100 percent of the candidates in six weeks get an a license so how's that fair mm -hmm. you know how do you differentiate in terms of coach quality so you've got an a license i've got an a license somebody else has got an a license who's better or who's is at the right level to be coaching you know the players in that country to develop mm -hmm. you know if, if everybody's got an a license now as i said it's a good thing but it needs to be rethought and then the other thing I would change is the or develop. I wouldn't change. I think there needs to be a lot more grassroots uh, leagues and clubs because I remember when I was there, and even still, it's the same. Apart from one or two cities that are quite big, like Tirana, yeah. um, private academies. You know, there needs to be a lot more grassroots private academies yeah. to feed into the academies. Whereas the only route at the moment, yes, there's a, some private academies, but they play actually in the same level as the academies, mm -hmm. as the pro academies, yeah. if that makes sense. So, but there's no, there's no feeding into academies. So if I want to play, um, if I want to play in that country, and I, like I said, when I was 12, I'd have to go to the city that I was part of, and I'd have to play to one team. There's only one team there, one academy. If I wasn't good enough, I don't play football. Mm -hmm. So... What, what, how is that, you know, as you know, obviously, you know, really well now that development or player development looks different. You know, somebody might not be good enough at, at, at I don't know, 9, 10, 11, 12, mm -hmm. but actually might have that growth spurt. And then by the age of 14, 15, mm -hmm. has shown something different, um, which then they need another opportunity. But actually, it was not deemed good enough. So there's no other pathway or there's no, nowhere else for him to go. Mm -hmm. for that, those three, four years to, to go and train and to learn. So I think grassroots needs to be, you know, a lot more clubs need to, to, to open up or, or even the school leagues, you know, it's pretty mm -hmm. simple. Why not invest in some coaches in the schools to have a school league and the school leagues play on a Wednesday like they do in the UK, for example. Yeah. They all go around, you know, regional school leagues. And then through that way, you're developing players for the academies and then the academies can take them to the next level. So there's, there is actually a standard, you know, there's two different level at the moment it's kind of only one if you're not good enough for it you don't play football yeah, uh, yeah. as i said only only in some cities uh, because obviously in tirana is slightly different there is a few private academies or grassroots mm -hmm. academies but it's still that mentality of if you're not good enough you don't play even mm -hmm. in the private academies no mm -hmm. everybody needs an opportunity because everybody develops at different times at different mm -hmm. rates um, and that's that's the three things i would change and then, of course, you know, the stadiums need to be redeveloped because they need to mm -hmm. play in European competitions. And that's great. You know, the new national team stadium is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, I went there to watch uh, 
uh, Partizani cooks in uh, okay. February. It's lovely, you know, it's a great environment. Um, but again, if we do all of these things to develop, then the, there will be more income, there will be more coaching, there will be more, you know, work, there will be more, you know, analysts getting involved, more physios and so on. So now all of a sudden, there's not just a benefit of play, players, but actually the whole country benefits as, you know, employment. And then we'll get more players produced from there, as well as the ones, you know, in Europe. Uh, and I think we, we Kosovo and Albania would, would have some strong, strong uh, mm -hmm. national teams, which I think they're growing right now anyway, but they would have feed in from both, uh, you know, mm -hmm. in Europe and, and, and from the native land. Mm -hmm. No, for sure. And like you said, at the end of the day, it comes down to that coach education where you said, you know, where once you get to a certain age, if you're not good enough, you're not good enough, where it comes yeah. down to that lack of coach education, which needs a lot of work. It needs a lot of work. Um, Absolutely. And also, do you think, you know, in terms of like the ex-players, because we've had some really good ex-players that have played at a really good standard, do you feel they should have more of a voice over there in terms of the infrastructure? I do, but it has to be, it's a delicate subject because again, it has to be the right ones. It has to be somebody that actually also understands other systems and other philosophies in terms of outside of Albania. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, there has been some successful players there and I think they should be involved. Uh, they should be educated the right way. Now, I, I keep saying, I'm not saying that it's, it's a, you know, the worst education there, but I think they should be, uh, um, they should be pushed by their face. So get them involved, mm. but push them to go and watch, I don't know, go and watch in Italy, go and watch mm. uh, in Spain and learn something different and bring something different mm. because they, they, how much more different they're going to bring if they're brought up from the same environment and then going back into the same environment to coach it. So they're going to coach what they've, how they've been coached. So you want them to, to have more, more of a broad understanding and, you know, those are players that have, have a name and there would be, people would open the doors for them to come and observe, you know, if somebody contacted me, which the FA did actually, mm -hmm. um, to come and do a study visit at Watford, I was more than happy. But mm -hmm. twice I organized it, twice they cancelled. It's like, well, <laughs> you know, there's only so much yeah. I can do. Um, now I'm not you know, I'm not trying to put down the FA there because it might have been just one individual that, you know, dealt with any they didn't have the capacity to do it properly. But th this is something that, as I said, we're open to do, to support each other and to, to, to allow them to come and observe and ask questions And because they were thinking of redesigning the, the, the academy system and they wanted to see how we work here. Mm. I'm more than happy to support to do that. Um, mm. But that's the way I think they should be get involved first, go and learn, go and test uh, you know new systems and then then bring it implement it uh, there mm, yeah no for sure and also you know going back to in terms of the well, around 1998 um, and just a little bit before that as well the war was going on a lot of Albanians and Kosovans were were scattered around the world you know just for a better yeah. life now in terms of in the UK there's a huge Albanian community Kosovan community as well um, and more times it is a little bit divided especially when it comes to like maybe sports and things like that. Everyone's kind of trying to make it out really. Now, in terms of you, how do you think we can change that? And I know you've set up something like the, the Albanian uh, network for coaches, which, you know, for me, that was, that was brilliant. Um, because again, I think, um, yeah, before that, I don't think I knew of any Albanian coaches like that, let alone a lot of Albanian people, because where I grew up, there wasn't that much of that Albanian community. So for me, it was like I kind of lost that connection where till now, like my, in terms of speaking, I can speak it, but I'm not very confident with it. Uh, but yeah, going back to the question, how do you think we can change that division and kind of bring everyone together? I think it starts from things like you're, what you're doing and, and showing initiative and actually approaching just like I approached you, you approached me and actually having a common ground. You, I want to support you, you want to support me. Um, but um, I think we, <laughs> it is, it's something that nobody's done anything for us in the sense, not, not in a bad way, as in there has been a lot of support, but in terms of football, I didn't know anybody when I was here. You didn't know anyone. Um, and I, so I thought, okay, I, I know one or two people. So I started this group about two years ago mm. uh, on just uh, on WhatsApp. You know, I just had about 10 people that I knew and they knew one or two. And then slowly, slowly I thought, well, you know, with all the social media and all the different platforms that we can connect. Mm -hmm. uh, there's plenty more people out there, I think. And so I started in the UK, then we started growing to 20 people uh, and so on. And then 
now we've opened up even further. Um, so we've opened up uh, on Facebook, on on LinkedIn, and uh, obviously on uh, Instagram, and also on WhatsApp. So we have the four platforms where people can connect with. They don't have, you know, WhatsApp, or if they don't have mm. Facebook, they can be part of it in different ways. Um, the whole idea behind it is the group is there for, and the word network is network. It's simple, mm. just for them to network. So you know, if I can help you out in any way, I would love to do it. You know. It, it, and same if I if I can if you can help me out I'll ask for your help mm -hmm. um, and that's the whole point of it is there's no other benefit for the group apart from supporting each other um, so whether that's for jobs for experience for uh, just a general question or um, then that they can ask that question so that's the whole idea behind the the, the group uh, the group has created a little this is going back to players now so that was about coaches mm -hmm. and analysts scouts and so on so we have that group for for the for those professionals but again um we have such a love for the game i'm talking about ethnic albanians so we're talking about possible albanian uh or both together i always refer them together um we have such a love for the game that every like you said Eva, you you want your child to become a doctor <laughs> you yeah. want them to become a footballer yeah. um so the the, the the obviously the the father's lean in one way the, mm -hmm. the mother's kind of leaning the other way mm -hmm. um so there's so many involved and with a lot of potential and with the right environment, and a player needs the right environment, and I, I strongly believe, maybe I, probably not the right description to say, but uh, I think it goes hand in hand. The beast makes the environment, but also the environment makes the beast. So mm -hmm. the, the families, because of their hardship, uh, you know, uh, in, in hardships in, in Albania or Kosovo mm -hmm. or during the war, they have that work ethic, they have that desire to achieve something in their life, you know, and also for their kids to do something. So they instill that in them. Right. So if you look at those players, they, you, even when they play their hard work and their focus, they dedicate, you know, we've got a couple in there at Watford and you look at them in comparison to others, their, their focus and the desire to to want to achieve something is, is greater because they never had something like that or their families haven't had it, so they've instilled it in them. Um, so we're doing something for that community for the for the for the kids as well so we are looking to to do a uh, camp so this is from through the athletes albanian athletes group so a slightly small uh, organization that we've tried to set up as well and this is um there's no cost to it as in for the players they just come in they train and they we have a look at them if they're good enough so it's a camp um uh, we have a look at them and then if there's anybody that is academy standard we push them into the academy if there's anybody close to you know has shown some potential maybe we will put them in a private academy and we'll keep an eye on them mm -hmm. if the ones in the academies which we have a big list now uh, which we didn't know of we were just starting to to grow the list uh, and a couple of them obviously now with the national team which enzo has done a good job they're mm -hmm. now being called up with the, the first team national team um like uh, amanda Breuer, uh, who's at chelsea and so on mm -hmm. um the, the, these are things that have been done only in the last year or so mm. from Enzo, who's done it, you know, on a voluntary basis until a couple months ago. Mm. Um, but again, it's like he's been doing one thing, I've been doing another thing, you've been doing something else. Mm. Well, actually, no, we're all together here. When the camp comes there, we'll try and all support it in, in whatever way we can. Mm. It might not be physically being there, but you might know somebody mm. somewhere for another club to, 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 to send somebody on trial. Mm. So it's uh, the first camp is for that, basically just to support all the players that are in the grassroots, to have a, an opportunity, if they haven't had it before, to showcase their skills and then to hope them into academy. And then the ones that are in the academy to hopefully support them, maybe, you know, when we can technically and tactically and so on, if, if that is through individual coaching, but more so in education of the parents and, mm -hmm. and the child, you know, because that's that's a big big thing that you know us as coaches are are having at the moment. It's a, it's a difficulty, you know, having making sure that the parents understand how it works, how everything works, and also to educate the player that is you know that they need to stay focused and they need mm -hmm. to be dedicated in what they do. And um, there's a little thing, so maybe help them socially or psychologically a little bit through just a phone call if they need mm -hmm. it. Uh, again, this is, we have we have no cost for any all of it. It's it's only we're trying to do it because we didn't have the opportunity and we thought, yeah. okay, well, what, what can we do to better the next generation? So hopefully they, both groups uh, will kick on. Um, hopefully with the likes of yourself who have been great uh, yeah. and the Albanian Coaches Network to support even to, to put your podcast there for them, for you to yeah. share. So a little thing like that yeah. will, will benefit everybody. And if everyone can share something, not everybody has the capacity or 
has the experience maybe to share but actually those ones that don't have it they'll actually benefit mm -hmm. from us sharing mm -hmm. so hopefully through that we'll also help the staff you know in those groups to find new jobs or to be involved in football for longer than just a hobby uh, mm -hmm. because it starts as a hobby for most and then it ends up as it finishes as a hobby yeah. because they can't find a pathway as we spoke about right at the beginning it's so mm -hmm. hard you know to find, find a position as a full time but that's the whole idea behind those two groups mm -hmm. No, it's interesting. No, you've done you've done a great job so far in bringing people together, and um, yeah, it's just really good. I think that's the most important thing is, you know, trying to not say that I'm going to do this hundred percent where I'm going to help you. I'm going to try and help you as much as I can. I think that's the most important part of you know being transparent and being open. So, but yeah, you've done a great job so far. So salutes to you. No, I appreciate that. Like I said, it's not. This is <laughs> this is just an idea, mm. and the the group is going. In, it can go in many different directions mm -hmm. and I hope people in there take the initiative to to take in different directions like we've spoken together about mm -hmm. you know um, take it support yourself it's only mm -hmm. for you okay there's a, here's another platform for you to to grow what you're mm -hmm. doing currently mm -hmm. that's what we want we want mm -hmm. that to, and at some point I hope you you know become successful that you can say well this group you know support me you, yeah, so yeah, other yeah. people can join the group yeah so that's the whole uh, idea behind it and I hope it does grow um, mm -hmm. like I said there's no benefit individual benefits to anybody apart mm -hmm. from you know using the network within the group um, mm -hmm. so hopefully through that and now everybody will see that instead of seeing it as a okay you know somebody started something to mm -hmm. make some money well it's yeah, not yeah, it's yeah. not that it's not yeah. that at all um, there's no cost of being part of the group or anything like that hopefully as I said the, 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 we could support coaches my my I hope we can fundraise at one day that we can support coaches that want to get into mm -hmm. coaching through, you know, just fundraising uh, and giving them, paying their qualifications. Mm -hmm. uh, so it could be, uh, it could go, have the potential to be that successful if, mm -hmm. if people continue to do what they're doing right now, which is, you know, is, is, is going along quite well. Mm -hmm. No, for sure, for sure. Yeah, may, may long it continue. I'm sure it will though, for sure. Okay. But in, ter in terms of players, you, you were saying in terms of players that the camps and in terms of players as a coach what do you look for in players uh not stating the obvious obviously with the technical tactical obviously they have to be good enough technically uh yeah. to be able to play in academy football um and, and also have a good understanding of the game um but i go my first thing would be uh personality uh, and then in, within personality come come many different things. Mm -hmm. So if I can just mention mention a few, um, so I'd say first thing is problem solving. Mm -hmm. So somebody you know with, with anything you do in life, you have to problem solve. You have to figure out different ways to to learn and to to adapt and 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 and, and try and. So if if me and you are talking right now or we're competing right now, I need to figure mm -hmm. out. How do I beat you? So I'm problem solving. So one v ones constantly because that's mm -hmm. the whole game. Really, it's, mm -hmm. if you break it down and if you really go into a microscopic lens, it's a one v ones always. So you have to problem solve how you manipulate your your direct opponent. And um, so that would be one of the one of the first things. And then you know we spoke about the the values and beliefs that they have inside that you can you can see it through them, which is hard work, dedication, commitment, resilience. You know not giving up um, their focus, bravery. Now mm -hmm. we talk about bravery uh, and resilience. Resilience can, there's many different categories of mm -hmm. it and bravery, you know, resilience can be, you know, you know, it's, it's not going so well for you and you, you know, you keep going, for example, but there's many other uh, subcategories to it. And then bravery, it could be bravery uh, going into challenges or it could be bravery to get in the ball, you know, and always wanting to get in the ball. It could be bravery to always, uh, find a way to play forward, which is a big thing, you know, going on at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, not just playing sideways and backwards and playing safe. That those are all bravery. You know, being brave to lose the ball mm -hmm. is a big thing as well. You know, some players play safe just so they don't look bad because they lost the ball. So all those little things, I think, uh, for me, come under the character of the individual. Um, so personality is a massive, massive. Uh, mm -hmm. Thing that if you want to make it professionally you 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 have to have it mm -hmm. you can only that you know technically and tactically your ability or your physical ability will get you to a certain stage or will open a few doors for you or it will get you in the, in the door but it won't keep you in there and like i mentioned about some of the individuals that we currently have at the club and some of the ones i've been working at from other clubs you know during this period right now mm -hmm. uh we actually funny enough 
talking about the, the community, how we're doing. We, we know we're doing some sessions now with players that are in academy to maintain mm-hmm. their fitness and some of them are in delicate uh, mm-hmm. parts of their career where they're under 18s waiting for a pro contract or under 16 waiting for a scholarship. And we've been working with them. And you, if you look at them, they have these characteristics. They have because they've been still through them, through their parents. Mm-hmm. Um, so, the, yeah, personality is a, it's a big thing. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Do you think you can teach that bravery that you're saying in terms of like tackling, of course, you know, trying to install forward passing and things like that, that is something that you can work on. But in terms of, you know, having that hunger, having that personality, do you think you can coach that? I, I think you can coach it based on your environment. So like we mentioned earlier about the beast makes the environment mm-hmm. and the environment makes the beast as well. So the coach has a big responsibility in that and also the family. So mm-hmm. if the both work hand in hand in terms of, you know, having certain things like I speak constantly sometimes to talk to the parents and try and try and say, we need to work together. We need mm-hmm. to communicate and we need to try and try and instill the same uh, rules and, and, and uh, into the players. And they they buy into that, and I think that's really important because when you set the right environment in training, the player yeah. will thrive. Will have to do certain things because the, the rest of the group are doing it, for example. Mm-hmm. So there's no slacking, and they you you create an environment where it's um, positive uh, competition, and I think that's a big part of it. You know, they're also const- constantly competing with each other in, in the right way, and there's that positive positive aggression through it. So yes, you can. But it has to come hand in hand with the family as well, I think, because that, mm-hmm. you know, it comes from a little bit from that environment and the coaching environment. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but I, I think that there, there's only so much. Uh, hopefully, you mm-hmm. know, there's work done at home that will will also support us uh, training. Mm, yeah, no, for sure. It's interesting. It's interesting. But I want to I want to take it back to you now in terms of your career. What's your career goals? And would you say you're in track with your career goals at the moment? I think everybody, everybody has uh, their you know goals, and I've learned a lot about goals. And uh, during during the last, I'd say, eight to ten years, mm-hmm. uh, initially, you know, you start, you have your you thinking when you start the beginning. Yeah, you know, I I want to be managing and I want to be uh, coaching at this level and so on. That's a, That's a great dream, you know. The dreams are for free, as they say. Mm. But you have to break it down. You have to, you know, work for it. And as you know, it's a really competitive environment. So uh, goals have to be achievable. And and I, I've broken down my ones. Uh, and I always try to, and I always reevaluate them as I go through the years because sometimes, you know, although you might want that role and that 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 position that you always always desired for a certain year, but actually you might need another two years to achieve mm. it because learning is not linear you know it's not always uh you know always up like that sometimes you know you might you might need to do a qualification or two you might need to stay at that level to just learn a little bit more about that phase or or the next phase that you want to work in Uh, so in terms of me where i want to go uh, in the next year or two i just want to learn where i am you know i'm very fortunate i'm i'm very pleased that I have been given the opportunity. I work for it. Don't get me wrong, mm-hmm. but you know I think that's the minimum you can do uh, to achieve something. You need to work. You need to dedicate. You need to educate yourself. Uh, so in the next year or two, I'd like to learn a little bit more about my role and you know about the PDP, mm-hmm. which takes me to my next one. So that would be my short term short term goal, one to two years. Medium term goal, two to five years, would be working within a PDP. Uh, it's that's. Mm-hmm something i always wanted to go into management i did semi-pro manage you know football as a, as a manager for five years i learned a lot i never mm-hmm. never uh, forget that opportunity and that that learning that i got there that was at the right club that gave me the time and the freedom to do and and uh, you know what i thought was the right thing at the time but you go to most clubs and you're a manager you you don't do well you lose a couple games yeah. you're out you know mm-hmm. management is you have to know your things. You need to know your philosophy, your playing style, and so on. And you need to really be ready to go into management. Uh, I'm talking about professionally because mm-hmm. you could lose your job. You got a mortgage. You know, not everybody can earn the amount of money that you know some people think everybody mm-hmm. earns. You got a mortgage. You got you know family to 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 look after. So it's not it's not as easy as that. So I think for me, I, I reevaluated that. And I thought, okay, PDP, learn a little bit more about the game there, mm-hmm. develop so it's a bit more stable. And then in terms of long term, we're talking about five to 10 years. I'd like to go into first team more as a coach. Uh, I, I see management takes, it has a lot of, you know, you have to learn a lot, learn a lot about people more than anything. Mm-hmm. Um, 
uh, as, as you know. Um, but yeah, in five to ten years, probably going to a first team coaching uh, part of a group of staff, uh, even just as a head coach, but under somebody else, just to learn again. Uh, I'm quite keen on, on, on learning how other people work, and mm-hmm. and that changes, and you know, or, or or consolidates what I know, kind of thing. You know, free working from other people, and mm-hmm. um, but yeah, those are my my me short medium and long-term goals no perfect i love that so at the beginning when i said you know hopefully you'll become the manager of the national team one day that's out the window then it'll be just as a coach if you were to get into it <laughs> uh, listen listen we never write anything off uh, yeah. i'm more than happy to help uh, more than anything than thinking about okay it's, i'd like to manage it i like mm. i like to support so if there if the opportunity ever comes in any capacity capacity to go and help Mm-hmm. Uh, back home, I'm more than happy to do so. Even even through doing this, maybe that this will help one or two people there just to have a better understanding of how it mm-hmm. works here, or pick up one or two things. I'm more than happy, or maybe it will encourage some people to be part of the group, and then there there I can share more of uh, what the way I see the game or what I'm doing currently. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'd love to to support the national team one day and in any capacity, like I said, either whether that's just helping the coaches there or helping the youth teams. I went to watch them a couple of times. Um, or just to, to to become a coach, but like I said, I don't want to write anything off. I'm learning right now. I'm, I'm developing, I'm, and that's 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 the key. Um, but anyone who needs my help from there, I'm more than happy to have to provide my my expertise. No, perfect, perfect. Now, yeah, hopefully, well, that's the whole aim of this podcast. Again, is you know to kind of make a difference to someone that maybe is looking to get into coaching or even players, you know, for them to understand what's expected from them from certain coaches, and especially like yourself, you're coaching at a, at a high level. So, really appreciate you taking your time out, um, and just thank you again, and and want to wish you the best of luck going forward, and I'm sure you'll get to higher levels one day. No, I really appreciate uh, you inviting me in. If any, if obviously you know already, but if anybody wants to get in touch, they're more than welcome to get in touch through LinkedIn or Instagram or, um, or even through the network that we have uh, in the in the different platforms, the Albanian Coaches Network. If they need any support, um, myself, yourself, we're both yeah. on it. So if then they all need anything, um, there's plenty of other people with different experiences in the group that mm-hmm. could provide different different support. Uh, within the means of course you know we'll, because we're all doing other jobs as well yeah, but yeah. whatever we can help with we're more than happy to help no for sure no, no thank um, you again thank you for inviting me thank you thank you